One. Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. The Indian Finance Minister Nirmala Sitaraman is part of her budget announcement said that India intends to introduce a central bank digital currency during the course of the year. Uh, we know that the conversation has been going on at the central bank level. A small pilot seems to be underway, though we have very little information about it. Uh, but as central banks move towards digital currencies, there are a number of conceptual issues to try and understand. And helping us do just that uh, is Professor Isar Prasad, professor at Cornell University and author uh, of a recent book, The Future of Money, How the Digital Revolution is Transforming Currencies and Finance, a must-read book in the current context. So, Professor Prasad, very grateful for your time here on Bloomberg Quint. Thank you for having me on, Ira. Uh, Professor Prasad, I'll ask you first uh, a basic question to start. Uh, you know, uh, the concept of a CBDC or digital currencies has been around for a few years. Uh, certainly, there seems to be greater urgency on the part of central banks to move towards it quicker, or at least conceptually understand it quicker, and then see uh, how to move towards implementing it. Uh, what do you think has prompted this greater urgency? The reality that every central bank um, around the world, whether in a developing country or advanced economy faces, is that cash, that is physical currency, seems to be on its way out. Digital payments of various forms are beginning to take over. So for central banks, it's really a question of whether they're going to keep their money um, still relevant at the retail level. Now, if you think about digital money, most of what we do in uh, um, our day-to-day -day transactions is already digital to a very large extent. Our bank balances are already digital. Uh, many of us use credit cards, debit cards, other payment systems um, to conduct day-to-day -day transactions. Um, but the question is whether central bank money will continue playing a role um, at the retail level. So that's basically what CBDCs come down to. They're essentially digital versions of the physical cash that we have been used to for a long time. Uh, Professor Prasad, one uh, explanation given as to why central banks are you know, keener to move towards this quicker now is that uh, private virtual currencies, the virtual currencies seem to have uh, gained in attention. Uh, although what has gained is more uh, the asset aspect of these, certainly not the currency or medium of exchange. So, uh, but yet, the sort of uh, the attraction of these virtual currencies, the private ones seem to have uh, sent the message across to central banks that they need to move quicker towards digital currencies as well. That's true. When Bitcoin was created um, back in 2009, it was meant to serve as a medium of exchange that would not require um, the use of central bank money or a trusted intermediary such as um, a commercial bank or a credit card provider. Um, and in principle, one could also conduct those transactions just using digital identities. Now, it turns out that Bitcoin has not worked well in its stated purpose, which is to um, be a medium of exchange, because it turns out it has very unstable value, um, and it's not very efficient at processing large volumes of transactions. But it's given birth to new cryptocurrencies called stable coins, which try to create more efficient payment mechanisms, but those are backed up by stores of fiat currencies and therefore um, have stable value. But the cryptocurrency revolution has really lit a fire under central banks, as you pointed out, um, to start thinking about issuing digital versions of their own currencies, because it's becoming clear that technologically it is much more feasible right now. And certainly central banks might have come to start thinking about CBDCs just because the digital payments, including mobile payments, are rapidly becoming the norm around the world. But certainly cryptocurrencies have accelerated that move um, and really caused central banks to sit up and take notice. And they are acting now. Uh, from a very uh, sort of, uh, you know, a user's perspective, uh, is it good enough to describe this simply as digital cash or are there too many nuances here? Now, um, it's worth thinking about what form exactly a CBDC will take. Um, a retail CBDC could take one of a uh, um, couple of forms. One is simply um, like a prepaid card, except um, it would be an account with a prepaid balance that you would have on your phone. Um, this is the approach that some Latin American economies, um, such as Uruguay, have taken in their CBDC experiments. But around the world right now, a different form of CBDC is beginning to take uh, um, uh, prominence. And that is where the CBDC effectively functions as a token in a digital payment system. So one can think about um, digital wallets um, where one could hold something like cryptocurrencies, but equally one could hold CBDCs 
um, in digital wallets, which would essentially um, be sort of like accounts, um, except these would typically be non-interest bearing accounts, but that you could use um, to make payments. So it would be in some ways very similar uh, to a bank account and being able to make electronic transfers from that bank account, except this would be provided by the central bank at very low cost. And in principle, um, it would be a payment system, a digital payment system that everybody would have access to, even if you did not have access to a bank account or a credit card to back it up. Uh, some uh, design uh, issues firstly, uh, Professor Prasad. Is it clear that the benefit or most of the thinking is on the retail CBDC rather than the wholesale CBDC? So it's worth making that uh, um, important distinction. So a wholesale CBDC would essentially be a slight improvement over the wholesale money um, that central banks already provide, which are essentially um, reserves that enable commercial banks to conduct payment and settlement of transactions amongst um, themselves. Now, um, those sorts of uh, reserves are already digital. So one might ask, what is new about a wholesale CBDC? But in many countries, there are attempts to use the new financial technologies, especially the blockchain technology, in ways that make these interbank payments and um, settlements much more efficient and in a way that saves these commercial banks from having to hold large amounts of liquidity in order to settle their balances at the end of the day. Some countries have conducted experiments with wholesale CBDC, for instance, the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is Singapore Central Bank. It turns out there are some efficiency gains to be had, but it doesn't look like that will be transformative in any way. It is really the digitization of retail money that is transformative because so far, central banks have provided money for retail transactions only in physical form. So that's going to be the real dramatic change. Uh, is China the furthest along in terms of uh, experimenting with the retail CBDC? Are there learnings from their uh, experiment and pilot projects so far? Now, it turns out that the um, central bank digital currency movement is um, gaining traction around the world. In fact, um, the Bahamas is um, the first country to issue a nationwide CBDC, the sand dollar. Nigeria has also issued a CBDC that is in principle available nationwide. As of now, there are three countries that have initiated CBDC experiments, China, Sweden, and Japan. China and Sweden are the farthest along in terms of their experiments. And what we are learning from these experiments are a set of very useful lessons about how to balance the risks and the benefits. And there are many benefits, but potentially also certain risks to having a CBDC. If you think about a central bank providing a low cost digital payment system, that could squelch private sector innovation. After all, um, what private payment provider can compete with a, um, a government backed agency? There are also concerns that if a CBDC were to take the form of um, uh, account based CBDCs, then we might end up in a world where you could have commercial bank deposits migrating to the central bank, especially in times of financial peril. Um, there are many of these risks out there in addition to a, a, a huge risk, which is that as we move away from cash towards digital forms of money, we lose whatever vestiges of privacy and confidentiality we may have left in our financial lives. It turns out that the experiments that are underway around the world are showing us ways to at least mitigate, if not eliminate these risks. One um, example is that of the um, Bahamian CBDC. The Bahamian Central Bank has decided that uh, simply by putting a cap on the amount of money that can be held in a CBDC account, you can um, block the possibility of a wholesale flight of deposits away from the commercial banking system. China and Sweden are experimenting with a two-tier approach to a CBDC, which I think is ultimately the form it will take in many countries. So in that system, essentially, the central bank provides a payment infrastructure at the back end, while at the front end, in terms of actual provision of payment services, it is still private payment providers, such as commercial banks, um, other types of payment providers, perhaps even um, telecom operators who are figuring out how they can compete and innovate in terms of providing the most effective 
front-end payment services. So there might be a balance that can be struck here where the government provides the payment infrastructure um, and it is the uh, private payment providers that are still responsible for front-end services so you don't squelch private sector innovation and competition in terms of payments. Uh, actually, I'm going to get into some of those issues, particularly the bank issues. So would this be or is the thinking moving in the direction that this would not necessarily be a direct claim on the central bank it could still go via a banking intermediary uh, because the risk of disrupting the banking system and banking system deposit seems to be something uh, that you know most central banks would tread very carefully towards that is a very important question and i think um, uh, it's worth clarifying that most central banks contemplating CBDCs, first of all, view it as coexisting with cash. My view is that eventually cash will organically disappear, but no central bank is talking about eliminating cash when it introduces a CBDC. And most central banks also talk about CBDC as being very similar um, conceptually um, to cash. In other words, CBDCs will remain liabilities of the central bank. They will be distributed by commercial banks much the way cash is right now. So the way uh, cash works right now is that cash is provided not directly by the central bank, but to commercial banks and other financial institutions in exchange for their depositing reserves with the central bank. And then the commercial banks go out and distribute cash um, to their customers who could be businesses um, or consumers. So a CBDC is in many ways going to be quite similar, except it is going to be digital. It will still be a liability of the central bank. It will not be a liability of the commercial banks that are distributing it, but the front end distribution including perhaps some of the regulatory functions such as know your customer um, uh, functions related to maintenance of the digital wallets could be maintained by commercial banks. So the structure is in many ways going to be similar. And most central banks that are introducing CBDCs also talk about it like cash as being a zero interest bearing um, instrument. Of course, the CBDC has the potential to bear either positive or negative um, rates of return. But as of now, the presumption is that it will be very similar to cash, except that it will not be physical in nature. It would be important to put some of these limits that you, I think you said Bahamas have tried that in terms of how much you can hold in terms of digital currency versus, say, uh, cash. Uh, because if you don't, then uh, there are implications even for banking system liquidity if there is a large flight of uh, deposits from regular cash deposits to digital uh, deposits. Uh, so that uh, that shift over would have to be moderated over a period of time, if at all it, uh, it, it is to happen. That's correct. And this is a very serious risk. I think disintermediation of the banking system in any country would not be a desirable outcome. And if people decided that even if their central bank digital currency accounts don't pay any interest compared to commercial bank accounts, which do pay an interest, but they may view CBDC accounts as just being safer in general, because after all, um, it is an account being maintained at a central bank, which is in turn backed up by a government, especially in times of financial uh, distress, they might want to switch their um, money away from commercial banks into um, central bank accounts. And this would put central banks um, in a very difficult position position of being the ones that have to allocate credit in an economy, and it would create significant risk for the commercial banking system. I think no central bank and none of us really wants this outcome, um, and I think we're coming up with ways that this risk can be mitigated, like I um, pointed out, essentially by limiting the amount of money that can be held in CBDC accounts and making sure um, that the digital wallets are in fact maintained by commercial banks. So these would be non-interest bearing CBDC digital wallets uh, in parallel with commercial banks' own interest bearing um, deposit accounts. So I think these risks can be managed, but it should not be completely um, taken off the table as a, um, as a risk. And uh, we have to think very carefully about design choices that mitigate these and the many other risks associated with CBDCs. Uh, tangentially, you know, I've heard both arguments that in times of stress, uh, a CBDC or a digital currency can accelerate bank runs. On the other hand, I've heard a separate view that perhaps there is no need for or, uh, for bank runs if, it, uh, if you're in a digital currency system, which is a direct claim on the central bank. Uh, how do you see that dynamic, uh, again, in times of potential stress and in times where digital currencies uh, have been adopted uh, at a reasonable scale? 
Now, that's a good point at which to think about the motivations for issuing a retail CBDC. Um, as I pointed out, for many central banks, the issue may be whether they want their money to be relevant at the retail level or not. But one could very well envision a world where the central bank is not providing the money that we conduct our daily transactions with. That's all handled by uh, um, various sorts of payment platforms and uh, payment providers. But still, the central bank can conduct its monetary policy quite efficiently, even if it is not issuing um, cash um, of any sort. So why are central banks thinking about issuing CBDCs? In many countries, it is seen as a pathway to financial inclusion, giving the entire population easy access to a low-cost digital payment system. In a country like Sweden, the point you raise becomes an important one. So in Sweden, the private sector is doing a great job of providing digital payments, but the Swedish central bank, the Riksbank, is concerned that if the entire payments infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector, it becomes vulnerable to confidence issues, possibly technological vulnerabilities. So the e-kroner project is being designed exactly as a backstop to the private payments infrastructure. So the Riksbank argues that in its role as the maintainer of financial stability, it needs to make sure there is a reliable payment system that will work even if the private payment systems um, fail for any reason. In China, there were concerns about Alipay and WeChat Pay, the two dominant payment providers, essentially um, limiting competition and innovation in that space, collecting huge amounts of uh, data that uh, they were not willing to share with the government until recently. So there are different motivations at play. But in all of these cases, I think um, governments and central banks are very, very cognizant of the risks that a CBDC might face in terms of disintermediation of the banking system. And I think we will see designs that prevent um, this outcome. Of course, commercial banks are facing big threats to their business model from fintech platforms that are directly intermediating between savers and borrowers that are creating more efficient ways of doing financial transactions. But to have that risk come from a CBDC is, I think, something nobody wants. Uh, Professor Prasad, from a monetary policy perspective, uh, what are some of the things that will have to be thought about? Uh, you alluded to negative interest rates here in the emerging world. That's uh, not a clear and present uh, danger for sure. Uh, but there are other implications for liquidity management, perhaps for cross-border capital flows. If one of the uses of a CBDC is uh, more seamless cross-border transactions, uh, would those be some, uh, and are there other aspects that monetary policy authorities will have to think about? Now, monetary policy implementation and transmission is going to become very challenging um, as a result of the new financial technologies, even if there are efficiency gains to be had. Um, we spoke about wholesale CBDC potentially making interbank payment and settlement much more effective. If you think about uh, um, uh, major central banks, including the Fed, um, the policy rate that they um, use to run monetary policy is effectively the interbank borrowing rate. There is um, uh, money that central banks use to settle balances between themselves overnight. So this is a very short term interest rate. If commercial banks can do a lot of these payments and settlements, and netting out of transactions um, between themselves without involving the central bank payment mechanism, that could mean that the traditional monetary policy instruments start gaining less traction. We spoke about the possibility that commercial banks become less important in terms of uh, um, the financial system that is evolving in many countries. Um, now, we economists don't fully understand um, uh, how central banking actually works in terms of how monetary policy actions get transmitted to economic activity and inflation. The one channel we do understand better than others is the banking channel, how bank deposit and lending rates respond when the central bank changes its policy rates. If commercial banks become less important, then we're going to face some challenges in figuring out what the interest sensitivity of fintech platforms and other non-traditional financial providers is when the central bank changes its policy rates and how those policy rates are going to affect economic activity and inflation. So monetary policy transmission becomes important. And you've raised an important issue about how CBDCs, both retail and wholesale, might ultimately um, lead to more efficient international payments. And indeed, even if you set aside CBDCs, we are beginning to see international payments which face a lot of impediments in terms of cost, speed of execution, finality of settlement. We're seeing technologies improve all of that, 
The good thing is that it'll make you know payments much easier. It'll make it much easier for economic migrants sending remittances back to their uh, home countries. It'll be better for importers and exporters. But the new conduits for financial uh, flows will make it much harder to manage capital flows. It'll lead to potentially much greater capital flow volatility, exchange rate volatility. So for emerging markets, central banks and policymakers in particular, there are many benefits to be had, but certain elements of volatility are going to come with the territory as well. Uh, a question from a user's perspective, and then I'll just uh, come to technology at the end. Uh, so, you know, in a country like India, and this is likely an India-specific question, uh, our payment systems are, uh, you know, fairly ahead of the curve, uh, whether it's at the retail end uh, or it's even large volume payments. We are real, real time, 24-7, pretty much across payment systems. So that use case of CBDC to make payments more efficient, to uh, lead to more inclusion, that perhaps is not sufficient reason to introduce or to move towards a retail CBDC, or, or do you think it still is? You're absolutely right, Ira. In fact, it is um, uh, interesting and somewhat paradoxical um, that advanced economies like the US still have problems with uh, uh, people having easy access to digital payments. So um, uh, sitting here in Washington, you know, I can um, use Apple Pay or um, Venmo um, through my phone, but those have to be connected uh, to a bank account or a credit card. And about 5% of households in the U.S. are still unbanked or underbanked. India and China, I think, are doing a fantastic job in terms of providing easy and widespread access uh, to low-cost digital payments to the entire population, including small businesses. So there is a legitimate question, what is the user case um, in a country like India um, or for that matter, China? As I mentioned in China, there are other objectives of the government, including maintaining control um, of the data collected from payment platforms that they seem very eager about. And in India's case, we have a payments infrastructure that I think the government has very wisely set up um, that does provide um, open access to new payment providers um, who have to ensure interoperability of their payments with other payment providers, where there is very easy access um, that everybody has. So one can think about uh, um, an Indian digital rupee um, as basically an additional payment instrument, um, and perhaps um, it will go into the corners of the country where existing payments are already not making inroads. But certainly, um, the user case for um, uh, retail CBDC is much weaker. One might take the case that uh, um, something like the Sweden approach is relevant here as well, that if we were in a different um, uh, economic environment where there were risks related to private payment providers and counterparty risk arose um, such that um, uh, there was a lack of confidence in dealing with private payment providers, it may be good to have an alternative payment system just as a backstop. Um, but I do actually agree with the premise of your question um, that the user case for a CBDC is somewhat weak um, uh, in India. But having said that, there might also be monetary policy reasons why a central bank might wish to keep um, its retail um, level money available as a payment option um, at the retail level so that um, certain elements of monetary policy implementation might become easier. And, you know, the other benefits of um, a CBDC, including um, using CBDC digital wallets to make lump sum transfers um, of money to households. Um, you know, in India, the infrastructure is already in place, but perhaps one can see CBDC digital wallets as basically providing another um, approach um, to, be able, uh, to be able to conduct those transfers, digital transfers of money in an efficient manner. Absolutely. Uh, just two last questions. Uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on technology, but there are obviously you know very core issues on technology still being discussed. Which, to your mind, are most important right now? Certainly, a lot of uh, chatter around the anonymity aspect of it, uh, you know, continues. That's a key question um, about whether um, central banks, first of all, have an obligation to provide a medium of exchange that gives us anonymity in our financial transactions and whether um, if a CBDC ultimately were to displace cash, we would live in a world um, where I could not buy you a cup of coffee without either a private payment provider or uh, a central bank or government agency um, knowing about it. Now, here too, technology is showing us a way forward. Uh, let me give you the example of China, 
where the central bank is uh, introducing different grades of digital wallets. So the highest grade digital wallet would be for um, high balances. It would uh, uh, be usable for high value transactions. And those would have to meet um, traditional know your customer and other regulatory requirements. But the government is also envisioning providing very low grade digital wallets where you can hold only small sums of money, which you can use only for low value transactions, but where you might have a much greater degree of transactional privacy. Um, there are also new technologies arising, um, uh, some uh, conceptual developments um, along the lines of what are called zero knowledge proofs that allow people to uh, get their identities verified without necessarily actually revealing their identities. In other words, uh, uh, there are ways in which um, I could prove to you um, that my bona fides are valid, that I'm a, 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 you know, a good person without necessarily revealing too much about myself. Um, so some of these technologies might actually give us ways um, to balance the government and central bank's needs to make sure um, that its money is not used um, for illicit transactions of any sort, either domestic or cross-border, um, while at the same time giving people some degree of privacy. So I think between technology and conceptual design, we might again be able to um, uh, make these balance, uh, these trade-offs uh, somewhat less dire than might seem right now. Uh, Professor Prasad, the final question, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you look around the world, there are still skeptics. That, I think it was the Australian Central Bank which said they didn't see enough reason to move in that direction. The Fed's paper that came out recently, again, uh, you know, put, put down the pros and cons. It's not clear how quickly they intend to move in that direction. Uh, but you're convinced, at least your book seems to suggest that this is the direction. It may not be a direction we'll move quickly in, in the next two or three years. Uh, but perhaps a longer time, this is the direction that we're moving in towards digital currencies. You, you, you seem fairly convinced of that. The era of cash is really drawing to an end. So central banks will have to stake out a position on whether they want their money uh, to be relevant for retail transactions or not. Um, in many countries like China and Sweden, uh, the use of cash has almost disappeared. In India, it is uh, um, declining very quickly. In some rich countries, uh, uh, somewhat paradoxically, including the US, um, uh, Japan, and Switzerland, uh, people still seem to cling to cash, but there too, uh, there is a move towards uh, um, digital payments. So I think ultimately, um, most central banks will end up issuing digital versions of their currencies. But it is, I think, wise for central banks to ponder this very carefully. Um, there are many risks um, out there. Um, so perhaps design choices can solve them, but there are risks to central banks um, as well. Um, I mentioned how uh, one could use uh, digital currencies perhaps to make sure that payments are not used for illicit purposes. You could think about programmable money um, that allows central bank money not to be used for certain purposes, to be used only for certain purposes. Um, we could end up with the central bank becoming an agent of the government, um, doing its bidding in a variety of fashions, going beyond its traditional monetary policy and financial stability functions. Um, so this is a somewhat dystopian view, um, but I don't think um, it can be completely ruled out. So we have to be very watchful. And what this means um, is that really central banks have to think about whether they have enough political and public support to move forward. So for instance, what the Fed's paper on the digital dollar does, it says, here are some pros and cons, but here is a long list of questions that we need to think about. And these are questions that need to be dealt with, not just at the technocratic level, but also in a way that thinks about the social and institutional ramifications of a move to a digital dollar. So I think ultimately we will move in that direction, but every central bank needs to make sure that it has the right sort of uh, um, analytical work done um, to make sure these trade-offs um, go in the right direction. And most importantly, to make sure um, that it has the public um, and institutional support necessary to go forward before uh, pushing forward too aggressively. Understood. Uh, I'll leave it at that, Professor Prasad. Professor Prasad, uh, 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 professor at uh, Cornell University, author of the book, Future of Money. Thanks so much for joining us here on Bloomberg. It's been my pleasure, Ira. That was a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for watching Bloomberg.